Well, this is the third adventure for uh, Gaspar the Fox. Uh, and like the previous two adventures, it's set around a real event. And the real event is the proms in the park that takes in Hyde Park each year. So each of the stories has a real community event. So the first book is the Angel Canal Festival. The second book is the De Beauvoir Fancy Dress Dog Show, which is hilarious every September. And this is the prom in the park. Uh, and I keep a little scrapbook for ideas and um, any photos I see of a, of a fox doing something unusual, I keep. And I saw a photograph of a London fox which had managed to get inside a bus garage um, and, and probably because the bus was still warm at night, it climbed into a bus and fell asleep. And it was one of those London overtop sightseeing buses. And there was this wonderful sequence of photographs that the driver took of, um, of this fox sitting right at the front of an empty bus when it went out first thing in the morning, looking at the sights of London. And I thought, I've got to do something with that. I had to find a way to get Gaspar on a bus and then back again, back home again. And that was the, the difficult thing. So the idea of, of Gaspar's friends going to the prom and, and not intending to take Gaspar, uh, and then Honey loses her scarf, Gaspar, steps on the bus to return the scarf, the doors close and off he goes on this journey through the sights of London. Uh, then I had to get him home again and I decided that the conductor in the park would be the kind man with the bicycle from book one because he would have to cycle back to Islington where Gaspar lived so Gaspar could trot behind him because he trusts him. The number 38 bus, which is the, the, the vehicle for getting Gaspar from his home in Islington to Hyde Park to the concert. Um, I chose the 38 wall because it's a real bus. Um, it's a great bus route. I use it all the time because it takes you from Islington right through the centre of London um, to Victoria train station. Very, very useful. And uh, But it also takes you past lots of my favourite sites. And these aren't the obvious sites in London, such as St Paul's Cathedral and uh, Buckingham Palace and Nelson's Column, which we've seen in millions of children's books. These are curious things that hopefully will be new to lots of people, such as the pyramid spire of St George's Church in Bloomsbury, which is actually a stepped pyramid. It's got King George on top, but it's then got a lion and a unicorn chasing each other up the spire. It's, it's absolutely incredible. And then opposite that is a shop known as the Umbrella Store. And it's a, a wonderful um, Edwardian looking shop. And it's just filled with hundreds of colorful umbrellas. Everybody knows it and loves it. So I very much wanted to have that in it. Um, Foyle's Bookstore, one of the biggest bookstores in London. Uh, and then Chinatown, Theatreland, Piccadilly Circus, um, Fortnum and Mason's clock with the two figures coming out. So, uh, and then Hyde Park and the proms in the park. So there are lots of really um, fascinating things visually, um, but also historically. And at the back of the book, I've written a, a guide to some of these sites with a little bit of history about them. So as well as the story, you get a kind of little guide to London. So the other reason for choosing a real bus route and sticking to it was so that hopefully children can say to their parents, you know, I'd love to go to London and take Gaspar's journey on the 38 bus. So it's a journey that you can follow. And James has actually drawn the map in the end papers of the book. Um, and I think that was that was the first time you'd drawn a map, wasn't it, James? It's the first time I've drawn a map of a real place, I think, like that. And uh, and of course it had to be reasonably accurate um, and it had to be done different layers so that certain things could be moved around by by your brilliant designer, Joanna. So uh, that was one of the hardest components of the book, I have to say. Um, it looks quite simple, but actually drawing all those streets and getting things in the right place and composing it so it will work across the two pages and contain all the information you want, particularly when the journey is actually going in the wrong direction for reading the double page spread of a book. You know, if you'd been traveling from West London to East London, then it would have been um, an easier job to do. But because you're traveling in the opposite direction, I found that quite challenging. Um, but anyway, um, I think uh, the end result um, works, works fine. It's, um, it's okay. 
Uh, for, for this book, the starting point was almost exactly a year ago. I went to London and met Zeb and we had a great day traveling on the number 38 bus and visiting all the sites that he's um, mentioned that Gaspar visits in the story and doing some sketching, taking some photographs. So gathering all the research material that I needed. Uh, we had a wonderful lunch with, with the real life honey um, and uh, um, Cleo and it was really valuable to, to actually be there and see these things, not just in isolation, but in their general environment. Because when you illustrate a book, quite often you start by thinking, oh, well, I'm going to include the umbrella shop or, um, or, or the church or, or any of the places that are mentioned, mentioned in the story. But it's only once you've visited them that you realize where they fit into the street and which angle you want to illustrate them from or which detail you might want to zoom in on. For example, Fort the Masons, I didn't want to illustrate the whole frontage of the shop because the story describes several parts of the shop. It describes a window, then it describes the clock. So one illustration wasn't going to capture all that because it would have to have those components really small to get them all in. And I wanted to zoom in on those. I wanted to zoom in on the window. I wanted to zoom in on the clock. And it's only once you visit the shop and look at it that you think, okay, the whole shop isn't going to work. I need to do this instead. So visiting those places, visiting those landmarks, making those notes, making those sketches, taking the pictures, all of that was 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 incredibly valuable. So it was a great day out. Thank you, Seb. A pleasure. It was lovely to have you here as always. But also um, I noticed that we spotted things together that neither of us would have thought to include. So when we were in um, Cleo's garden, I have to try not to call her Honey, her fictional name. Um, when we were in Cleo's garden, we spotted two little masks, two little ornaments on the back wall. Um, I can't remember what they were of. I mean, they were kind of just random faces. And we said, oh, because Honey is an actress, why don't we make those the comedy and tragedy masks which are associated with theatre? So James has included those in uh, in the illustration. We wouldn't have thought of that had we not actually been in Cleo's garden. There were lots of other little details like that. Yes, Cleo's got a, a lovely, uh, beautiful garden um, with shells along the edges of paths, which I used in one of the illustrations as well. So as Zeb says, you, you often spot little details like that, which unless you're there and you're looking with a particular um, agenda, I think you just don't notice them. So it makes the whole thing a much richer experience for me as an illustrator. When James and I first met face to face for the first time for lunch to talk about the first book, Gaspar the Fox, and we discovered all sorts of things we had in common, we both been to the same high school, 10 years apart. Um, but we also performed with orchestras, I narrate with orchestras, and James paints and narrates with orchestras. And we said then, wouldn't it be wonderful if one day we would be able to perform one of our Gaspar stories together on stage? So the conversation started then. I approached Jonathan Dove to ask him whether he would be interested in working on a Gaspar story. I chose Jonathan because I love his music. He's a local composer, so he lives in Gaspar's area, but also he's composed a lot of music for children. So he's brilliant at introducing orchestral music in a way that's very approachable to children. So once Jonathan had agreed that he would like to work on a Gaspar story, um, I needed to come up with a story and I didn't want him to adapt one of the existing books, uh, Gaspar the Fox or Gaspar Best in Show. I wanted to create something specifically designed as an orchestral uh, story. It's a story that in the same way that I write um, with half my brain thinking about how the words will inspire James to create beautiful pictures, I wanted to write in a way that had an ear for things that might inspire Jonathan. So this was a really rich creative experience for me because I was writing in a completely new way, splitting my brain in two and thinking about the sounds and also the pictures. So there are lots of cues for sounds in the story, such as the clock of Fort Mason's department store, Chinatown, theater land, the roar of traffic, lots of different cues that Jonathan picked up on. So, so from the very beginning, this was designed to be both a book and a concert. And I think probably quite unique in that respect, really. I think most orchestral works, apart from Peter and the Wolf, I think have been adaptations of something that already exists. 
we were very lucky that lots of orchestras around the UK were very keen on the idea and they all came on board and formed this consortium around Gaspar's Foxtrot. So they are the Philharmonia, the Dockland Symphonia, the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic, the Royal, Nas the Royal Scottish National Orchestra uh, and the Three Choirs Festival. Originally, the first performance was going to be at the Royal Festival Hall in London, but due to COVID, the festival hall is closed. So uh, Scotland now benefit from that and they claim the world premiere of the piece, which is happening um, in just a few weeks time, actually, uh, because they can't perform it live in concert halls in Scotland. They're actually going to film it, but film it in a very creative way using puppetry and animation. And it's going to be shared with every single primary school in Scotland. So again, uh, a kind of positive um, aspect of the pandemic is that actually it will have a much broader reach and, and reach every single child in, in Scotland, which is, we couldn't have dreamed of that. Firstly, one of the reasons for choosing an orchestra was uh, many children are, are unfamiliar with what an orchestra is, or um, in this digital world, any domestic keyboard can produce the sound of a wind instrument or, or a string instrument. So um, children, uh, unless they're lucky, don't get to see these real analog instruments. So that was one reason for wanting to create an orchestra or feature an orchestra. Another reason was because an orchestra is a collective experience. No one person is the star. So the concert could have been an opera singer um, or, or, or a soloist. Uh, but I, again, I'm also very conscious that we live in a world where we're obsessed with fame and stars, and I wanted it to be an orchestra where they are, as a team, producing this wonderful music. Um, I'm saddened that often children come up to me when I go to schools and when we do book events or concerts, and a question I get asked is, how do I become famous? And it's such a sad question because Children should find something they love doing and do it to the best of their ability and, and the pleasure from that should be their reward, whether it's a hobby or whether it's something they end up doing as a living. And if you become well known for that, all well and good, but to seek out with the sole aim of wanting to be famous um, is, it, it, well, it's, it's only going to lead to unhappiness, I believe. And so that was another reason why James and I were very keen that this was, this was a, an orchestra on stage and, and James performs with orchestras as I said earlier and um, I know that when he does visits in schools very often children are unfamiliar with with really what an orchestra is and it's a very exciting it's a it's a wonderful spectacle um, uh, James I think I gave you quite a lot of work asking you to to draw all the musicians of an orchestra absolutely I mean that was <laughs> quite the challenge um, because there's two or three pages where the orchestra appears and of course a, a typical symphony orchestra can have between 60 and 100 people on the stage all with their instruments and, uh, and, and, and drawing that is, is a challenge and keeping a particular aesthetic as well, you know, keeping the, the style that I use in the other Gaspar books, keeping it fresh and light and not being overburdened by, by fussing over too many details. Um, that was a challenge. Um, possibly the bigger challenge was having a crowd of 4,000 people in Hyde Park or whatever it is. <laughs> There's 40,000 people yeah. actually. <laughs> 40,000. <000. laughs> <laughs> uh, but you find you find ways around that and, and and I have to say Piccadilly Circus that was probably the hardest illustration in the whole book drawing Piccadilly Circus um, so there were some challenges in in terms of the illustration and uh, and and I enjoyed the challenges they just take time and they take a, a lot of thought and careful planning in terms of composition and, and uh, how you incorporate the texts within them because these great big scenes you want to just lose yourself. You want to just keep on painting and adding more sky and adding more trees if it's the park or, or adding more buildings if it's Piccadilly Circus. But you have to think, well, no, hang on. Actually, the words have got to go somewhere. So you have to just look at different um, 
views of Piccadilly Circus or the park and, and the stage and think, well, how can I compose those pages so that I show everything I want to as an artist in that illustration, but still leave room for the words to fit comfortably on the, on the page so that it's easy for children to read and it all works harmoniously, no pun intended. But going back to the stage performances, um, I mean, obviously Zeb will be narrating and, uh, and at some performances I'll be painting live, probably not for the Scottish performances, they're going to be creating an animation from the illustrations, but uh, we hope that um, once this pesky virus is out of the way, that I can join Zeb on stage and, and do live painting um, with, with the orchestra playing behind me. And um, yeah, that's gonna be very exciting. Um, and again, that will make these performances quite special, quite unique because you know it's quite quite often you see a, a narrated piece such as Paddington um, or uh, or Baba the elephant but to actually have an illustrator live illustrating on stage at the same time gives this extra dimension so I think it will be quite when we are able to perform live it will be it will be a wonderful spectacle for children and a great introduction to orchestral music form as well because there will be these added elements to hold their attention particularly for very young children when you are illustrating with the music along with the narration of course you can underpin what's happening in the music you can actually make the music make so much more sense for children it's no longer just a nice tune it actually has a specific meaning and i think that's really helpful for for children and actually i have to say for a lot of adults too to help them understand what the music is saying classical music or perhaps better orchestral music is something that they hear all the time, they hear it in adverts, they hear it in movies, um, both um, the real classics and also uh, modern scores for orchestras. And they hear this music all around them and they don't necessarily, a lot of children don't necessarily know what an orchestra is, as Zeb said earlier. They don't know what the instruments are. And they're very much part of our heritage, our culture. The, the music we're talking about, a lot of the music, it goes back hundreds of years and there are so many wonderful stories wrapped up in it, so many great pieces of music that tell stories. And to miss out on all that seems such a great shame, to just hear this music, to hear pieces of Beethoven or Tchaikovsky, or even Jonathan Dove, just casually um, in a movie or, or for an advert for pizza or something like that. I remember, I think um, Rossini's William Tell was used to advertise pizzas once. And, uh, and it's a shame because actually the story of William Tell is a great story. And a lot of these other stories are wonderful stories. So I hope if children come to the Gaspar concerts and understand that music, that instruments, that sounds can tell stories, it will open up that world for them and bring them a huge amount of pleasure through their lives. That's what we hope will happen. And that's why I think it's important. It's really very simple. It's about preserving our cultural heritage, which is what civilization is all about and bringing people pleasure. It brings great pleasure. And also, as I said earlier about this, this uh, an orchestra being a team and a, and a collective creative experience, I think it's fascinating for children to know that they're not all playing the melody. You know, you've got the double basses just playing, um, you know, a note here or there, um, and each of these instruments adds another layer and another texture, and as a whole, it creates the piece of music. And Jonathan very cleverly has composed uh, Gaspar's Foxtrot to be a partner work to Peter and the Wolf, the great work that introduces children to orchestral music because um, uh, Prokofiev uh, gives each of the characters in the story their own instrument. So children can actually hear the sound of the wolf, the sound of Peter, the sound of the bird. And Jonathan has done exactly the same thing with Gaspar's Foxtrot. So Honey has her theme, Finty the dog has her theme, Peter the cat has a wonderful little flourish, which is just like a cat's tail. So it'll be um, a wonderful resource, I hope, for music teachers in schools to be able to use it to, to, to show children how orchestral music is built up of all of these different layers. My favourite piece of classical music is probably Noah's Flood by Benjamin Britten for several reasons. Uh, Benjamin Britten was born in my hometown and uh, of Lowestoft in Suffolk, uh, where James also grew up and was, and was educated. And he captures the coastline there um, almost like 
putting a net out to sea, the, 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 the sea and the tide is, is captured in the staves of his music. And um, when I hear Noah's Flood, I'm transported straight back home. And I was lucky enough to be able to perform in it once. And it's one of the most uh, special experiences of my life because when um, Noah builds the ark and, and we performed it in a church back home in Lowestoft, it felt as if the entire congregation, the audience in this church were inside an ark, which of course was helped by the lovely medieval beams of the roof of the church and that we were all sailing off over sea together. So it's a very special piece of music for me. That's mine. I have a fondness for Noah's Flood too, for all the reasons Zeb described. I actually went to the Benjamin Britten High School uh, many, many years ago, and I was lucky enough to design a, a production uh, the same year that Zeb was appearing in, a, in the performance in Lowestoft. Uh, the Cheltenham Music Festival put on a production in Tewkesbury Abbey, and Tewkesbury Abbey had been surrounded by terrible floods, um, and so it was quite arc-like as well and um, we did a performance there and it was it was a, it was a huge amount of work to create the designs and, and put the production together but also a very wonderful experience um, that wouldn't be my first choice actually my first choice if i may would be rimsky korsakov's scheherazade all about the greatest storyteller who ever lived who spins her tales for a thousand and one nights to save herself from her rather murderous husband who of course eventually is tamed at the end by, by her, her wonderful tale telling. Um, and it's a piece I've worked with many times on stage, painting illustrations live during performances. And it's music I never tire of. It's, it's what I call my reset music. If I had a stress, stressful time, I've had a difficult day, if I just need to, to chill, I just play a, a recording of Scheherazade, 45 minutes, and I'm, I'm back where I should be. It's a, a magical piece, a real flying carpet of, of music and storytelling. I hope that he will be foxtrotting um, for uh, many years to come uh, uh, and that we'll have the opportunity to perform it um, lots of times. Uh, but yes, I mean, I would, I, I, would, I would love to repeat the experience with, with another story. Uh, I've just written a, a Christmas Gaspar story and, uh, and that may well lend itself uh, to music too, we'll have to see.